Hello, and welcome to this final read aloud of the last section of Maria Headley's translation of Beowulf, lines 28-21 to 31-82. This is uh, right after the death of Beowulf. Page 121. It was agony for the would-be savior so young to see his dear kinsman death rattling on barren ground. The dragon, that deep dweller, lay dead as well, having done in her enemy. She was limp and lifeless, her looping spine and scales no longer lolling about piles of gold, no longer ring-guarding. Keen-edged blades, sweet-hammered and fervently filed, had bitten her, broken her of soaring flight, ended her adventures, leaving her stiff as a shovel, split snake, dead in dark dirt beside a gilded grave. Never again would she soar through a starry sky, revel in rising rhapsody, rolling in and out of clouds and mist, a raging rainbow, glinting golden. She plummeted, earth struck, blunted in blissful brutality by Beowulf. Hardly in history has there been a man born, or so I'm told, who, brawny and brave as men may be, would be able to battle such a one, to throw himself into her biting breath, or even creep into her lair for fortune's sake, and fearlessly find the treasure keeper there, her eyes open, a wonder ward. The ancient horde had changed ownership now, bought by Beowulf's blood. Both he and his enemy had seen the edge of existence, tripped and fallen over it. It wasn't long before the forest-fled retainers attempted to regain their status. Those ten men who'd run for the hills, abandoning their king as the winged one was roaring in. The cowards who put their blades behind their backs when he needed their strength, shambled out of the woods, shields lifted, armor still on, to where the old king lay collapsed. They found Wiglaf, crumpled beside him, heart sick, his shoulder to the shoulder of his lord, trying to wake him with water, but it was over. There was no will left in Beowulf, no life spark to be ignited. God had decided, as he always does, we all know it, and bro, nobody changes God's mind. The young warrior had words for them, though, terse words for the cowards who had abandoned their king, Wiglaf, West and son, spat severity at the soldiers he'd found wanting. Anyone with half a brain's well aware that this king treated us like princes, giving us gifts the gear that guards us even now. He opened his arms, offered all who stood in his mead hall armor, helmets, mail shirts, treasures. He treated us, his thanes, like sons, gave us the glories he'd won. But hey, I guess he had no judgment. He threw those gifts away. What a fucking waste in time of war to armor and honor a corps of soldiers who'd ignore him when he needed them most. Our king had no cause to boast of his fight family. He never saw them fight. God allotted him a blow. He forced his blade into the fray, braver than all of you put together. I couldn't keep him safe, defending his flank, but God gave me strength to swing and help him. At least I, alone among these ranks, tried. My sword sank in, the enemy was injured, the dragon's fire oaths dimmed, her advances weaker, but I couldn't save him. Too few of you were loyal to our brave lord in times of trouble. Well, kiss it all goodbye, boys. Those treasures you hoarded, those gifts, those sparkling unswung swords, the homes you held by kindness of our king. That shit is gone. Your families will founder. Your freeholds will fall. The moment outland princes hear how you hid yourselves, disgrace your king, and let him die undefended? Are you warriors or weaklings? 
You should kill yourselves rather than live, having dealt him this damage. Wiglaf ordered that the battle's end be shouted out. Bad tidings brought to the men camped at the ridge, retainers and unchosen warriors waiting, heavy-hearted for reports. They'd spent the morning kneeling, nervous for their beloved lord, expecting all and any outcomes, king's death or return of the king. The messenger shouted truth plainly without hesitation. The rider sped to the headland, forecasting for all to hear. The people's prince, the wetter's lord and love, the Geet's good gold giver, is gone. The king is dead. The dragon did him in, but she's dead too, stretched beside him, an enemy slain by silver stabbing a knife. Beowulf's sword could not kill her no matter how he tried. Wiglaf is there now, with them both, Weyston's son, a survivor, holding vigil for his dead, a warrior's wake, for both the deer and the detested. Now, listen up. War is coming for us, for this country. Soon, our enemies will hear our king's been killed. From sea to sea, everyone, from Franks to Frisians, will mobilize. Historic hatreds. The Franks have felt fury since Hijlak led a flotilla of warships into Frisland. Though the Hetware held them there, attacked him, and won with woeful odds. Our leader, battle-dressed, was taken then, his body falling, his army mourning. He gave no winnings to his fighting force. The Merovingians haven't forgiven us. So, kindness will come from the, no kindness will come from the Swedes either. Only vow breaking, peace packs poison. On Gentiao, as everyone knows, slew Hathson, Hrethel's boy, at Ravenswood, back when the Geats first attacked the battle Schilfings. Vengeance was swift for the Geat attack. Otheri's father was ferocious, a seasoned elder general, and he slashed that seafarer, Hathson, and repossessed his own wife, mother to both Otheri and Onella, who'd been kidnapped. Golden rings wrung from her fingers. Angentheal wasn't finished. He pursued his Gidish enemies, driving them, panicked and bereft of their leader, to Ravenswood, where he and his company ran rings around the remnants, reminding them how weak they were. Through the black hours, he swore at them, promising punishments, telling them when the sun rose, he'd shine his sword on selected scalps and strung other soldiers from the gallows, make them treacle sweets for birds' beaks. But at dawn, when they were despairing, they heard the horn of Hijlak, and that hero came for them, following their trail with troops. The Swedes and Geats battled and plowed a bloody path, identifiable for miles. And no one, not even fools, could thank them, could think them finished fighting. The old man plotted murder and made a move, retreating with his people. Anjantheal knew higher ground would help him, but he knew too that Hijlak was hard, famous for his fight skills. The old man couldn't hold long against the sea warriors, not while keeping his wife, children, and followers safe. He damned them in behind sheltering walls, but Hijlak's men breached them, pouring into the sanctuary like flood water, drowning camp and confines. Anjentheau stood firm, gray and proud, but he was trapped, surrounded by swords, and Eofer was appointed the Swede king's judge and jury. Wolf, Wanred's son, rushed the old man in rage and struck him so that blood soaked his hair. Still, he did not back down, but raised his own sword and hacked harder than he'd been hit. The Swede king spun and struck, fighting for his people. One red son couldn't take him, brave wolf though he was, and his blows glanced off until Angentheau split his helmet and forced him to flee, falling, head bloodied, dazed though not dead. He was hurt, but he held, and finally his brother, Hijlak's loyal thane, Eofer, lifted his own sword, an ancient piece etched in ogre ruins, and smashed it into the old man's giant forged helmet, slashing past his shield. At last, Anjentheau fell, the defender of his realm done and gone. 
Everyone ran to assist Wolf, to bandage him and carry him from the field. Now they were custodians of the bloody mud. The walking warrior stripped on Jentheao of his gear, his iron mail, his fierce sword, his helmet, and ferried all this war treasure to Hijlak, who took the offering and said the giver would be repaid. He told the truth, and for their courage, Hrethel's heir, now king of the Geats, gave Eofur and Wolf a hundred thousand each in land gifts in interlocked rings of wealth to ratchet them up in status. That was a good king. None could critique his open hands. He also gave over to Eofur his only daughter, a bedmate to bind him, a kin bond and vow of loyalty. So, to sum it up, the feud with the Swedes isn't over and needs only this blood to activate it again, a border swarm, a war walking into Geatland the moment they learn that Beowulf is gone. He'd been keeping us safe for decades, counting coffers, battening the kingdom against invaders, defending his citizens, and all the while killing monsters too. Come now and hurry, men. Send him on his journey. Pay him our respects and carry our king and ring giver to his funerary rites. His pyre will be built, heaped with gold for melting, which he won with his life. The death hoard is too heavy for our hearts, and it will be burned along with him who won it. That gold isn't for decorating followers, not for starring the bosoms of young women, or latching in memory onto loyal throats. No, now is a time for mourning, for walking downcast, the exile's road, gray garbed and grim, for the king is dead, his song is silence, his laughter and entertainment forgotten. Take down your spears and touch that dawn-chilled metal, raise them toward a clouded world. No harp music will play to call warriors in, but instead we'll waken to the raven, a rush of black wings, telling us in raw song how she'd watch the wolf and eagle worrying our dead, carrion clawed, competing over the feast. This was the end of the forecast, and the auger wasn't wrong. That messenger delivered it as evenly as such bad news can be delivered. The troop was weeping, but they rose and went in woeful rows to Eagle's Cape, where, on the cold sand, they found their king, soul long spent, that man who'd given them everything he had, whose rings had warmed their hands. It was the end of his epic, the climactic close, and Beowulf, their warrior king, died mighty. They saw Beside him, a wrathful wonder, a sky dragon become ground ghost. That flame spitter, scourge of those coasts, had been scathed and sooted by her own song. She was fifty feet long, she who ruled in writhing rapture over their dreaming hours, diving through dawns to nest with her treasure. Now death had won her, the worm would no longer writhe with coins, but with worms. Beside her lay the dragon's dowry, grave good goblets and cups, dishes and knives, rust, devouring them now, though they'd spent a thousand winters serving the ghosts of powerful men. There was a spell on the hoard, left by a skeleton tribe, a, a ward that said no man could touch it unless God, glory dispenser and hoarder of humanity, chose a hero and gave permission for the treasures to disperse. What had he hoped, the man who'd pressed his people's precious things into a cave beneath the cape? All his keeping came to nothing. First, the dragon killed the king. Then the king killed the dragon. Maybe a man's mighty. Maybe he's known to all as a warrior. But death has his number. No one knows when it's been called, when he'll have to walk backward, out of the beer hall, exiled from life. So it was for Beowulf, when he sought battle in a barrow. Sure, the grave guardian was formidable, but our hero had no notion he was falling out of earth. 
The curse on that stony womb was set by men who'd impregnate it with treasure, claiming the confines theirs until doomsday. If they couldn't possess them, no one could. Any man who thieved was fated to perish, pushed into pagan places, punished forever. Beowulf never imagined gold could bring grief. He forgot. Not all gifts are forgetting. Wiglaf, Wayston's son, took the floor. One man slipped down this slope, he alone deciding, but we rest are roped to him. Many will suffer similar fates now. No counselor could convince our king, our old and beloved protector, that he shouldn't come at the guardian of this gold, but instead let her dream unmolested, drowsing alongside her beloved horde, ground nested until world's end. Beowulf's fate was written, too. He opened the barrow and showed us its bounty, but he paid in blood and bone. His destiny was too tempting, and it drew him here. I've been inside, counted treasures heaped in the dark, given my ticket to voyage, solitary, under tons of soil. I heaved a heap of heart-won gold into my arms, precious beyond compare, and bore it here to share it with my king. I carried all the treasure to where Beowulf could view it. He was alive then, though fading. He listed his longings, his last commands, bade me welcome you, man by man, and bid you build a barrow great enough to justify his gifts and his going. He wanted a memorial built to last, to light the future, because of all men who've ever lived, he was the strongest and the bravest and the brightest and the best. Now, come with me. Let us look on the treasure together, piled against the wall. I'll lead you to the dragon's lair and show you up close the golden ornaments so you'll know what your king died for. Meanwhile, let the beer be readied so when we emerge, we can carry Beowulf to it, lay him upon our love, and send him to his new hall under the throne of the Lord. Wayston's son, Wiglaf, courageous as ever, ordered heroes and hall hoarders to the forest to chop logs and splinter trees. All those men with men of their own collected kindling for the king. Now he'll be consumed. Let a white and brilliant flame catch our leader. Let the fire take him, our famous man, who fought off slings and arrows, who battled armies, who never backed down. At last a shaft sounded his depths, pursued the barb as it primed his heart feathers fanning across his breast. The son of Weiston summoned seven of his best men to descend again into darkness and went alongside them, the eighth man, entering that cursed place. One soldier, the man in front, carried a light. No one sought to gamble or grab. The guard was gone and the challenge was pointless. They Carried it all out, dazzled draped, a heaving hoard of gore brought gold, unprotected, and piled it in public. It was easy to enact their leader's last wish. They then heaved the dragon over the cliffs into the sea, brine bedding that beast bride, that ring taker. The endless accursed treasures they stacked on a cart and bore them with their dead leader, his skin gone gray as a barnacle. To Wales Cape. The Geats began the pyre, howling over Beowulf, their best brother, hanging horde helmets about it, shields and steel shirts, as he'd insisted. They placed him in the center of all this treasure, their lost love, and built a bonfire worthy of men's ends. Storm smoke shuddered from the blaze, thick and dark and the flames keen louder than any man's weeping. The whipping winds momentarily stilled until Beowulf's heart helm broke. His bones blackened as his boys bellowed their grief. Then another dirge rose, woven uninvited by a geetish woman, louder than the rest. She tore her hair and screamed her horror 
at the hell that was to come. More of the same. Reaping. Raping. Feasts of blood. Iron fortunes marching across her country. Claiming her body. The sky sipped the smoke and smiled. The Geats got down to it, driving the materials of the memorial into a mound, a promontory crowned with Beowulf's marker, lit, no, so, lit so sailors could see it from afar. Ten days it took to make their hero's new home. It contained, walled up, the remnant of his hoard gold, wrought to remain long after Geats were gone. Rings of kings and torques, jewels clouded with black smoke, the dragon's darlings. And before her, that lost tribes. A trove of treasure, trespassed cursed from out of earth, now gone to ground again. They covered it over with gravel, and I hear it's there still, a leftover lament, lacking living hands for spending. Twelve thanes, battle-tested sons of worthy men, took themselves to horseback and cursed around the tomb, and coursed around the tomb, weeping, wringing the old songs from their tongues, dirge chanting, telling the legend of Beowulf, their king, his courage, his fury, his wars. They did all this grieving the way men do. But, bro, no man knows, not me, not you, how to get to goodbye. His guys tried. They remembered the right words. Our king, lonely ring wielder, inheritor of everything. He was our man, but every man dies. Here he is now. Here our best boy lies. He rode hard. He stayed thirsty. He was the man. He was the man. <laughs>